It's a little inside joke, right? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gene. And thank you all for this opportunity to spend some time with you this morning. Uh, Katakon 6, six years, Dwayne. It's amazing, six years. Uh, the book's been out. Mike put the first book out over 10 years ago. And in the ensuing 10 years, what a, what a vibrant community that's been formed. I and mean, it's really, really impressive. Um, you know, it's, it's been great. So what I'd like to do this morning is share with you some bits of advice, some pearls of wisdom that were shared with me uh, by some very kind people through my 36-year career. Okay, now some of these, maybe even all of them, you've come across in your own, uh, in your own lives. But what I have found is that it's always good to get a, a little bit of a reminder of these from time to time. Okay? So... First, a little background. Uh, before I started my professional career, my work experience consists of working at McDonald's and bartending. How many people have ever worked at McDonald's? Raise your hand, be proud, right? I learned a lot at McDonald's, I hope you did as well. Uh, standard work, they had standards for everything, a standard way to do everything. Proper instruction, they were great at training and instructing people. Uh, 5S, I think that's the first time I experienced the expression, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean. Uh, I were voice to the customer. Every week we were getting different information from customers. We had like these secret diners that would come in and kind of spy on us, but we would get valuable information from them uh, to help us improve. And even pull Kanban systems, uh, believe it or not. Now, I didn't realize any of this until I received formal training in those concepts in the mid-1980s. And then I realized, wow, we were doing a lot of this in, in uh, McDonald's. Um, so, at least we were, and McDonald's was doing these things in the late 70s and early 80s. I can't speak for what they're doing now. Uh, but, bartending. What did I learn with bartending? I learned a lot about people, not least of which is alcohol doesn't tend to bring out the best in people. Right? <laughs> there, there, frankly, there's not a lot of good drunks, to be honest. Uh, people think they are. Oh, I'm a happy drunk. Eh, probably not. Uh, so I learned a lot about customers, customer relations, managing those over, over time and in difficult circumstances. Uh, so I always like encourage organizations to give serious consideration to people with service experience when they're, you know, looking to hire people um, for whatever positions they have. So it was with that background that the General Electric Company decided to hire me in their corporate management development program. I have no idea what they were thinking about, but that's what they chose to do. Uh, it was a two-year program that took me three years to complete, nearly three years to complete. I'm a slow learner. And uh, it was a great program. I worked in three different businesses, um, three different countries, six different management positions. We had classes every week, we had classes every week on different topics like quality management, continuous flow, facilitative leadership, strategic planning, and so on. We would even do study trips to other organizations that excelled in particular uh, subjects. Uh, needless to say, it was a, just a tremendous learning experience uh, during the program. And my second manager was a gentleman named um, Joe Kozak. And he had an interesting story. He actually started at GE as a janitor. And he took advantage of their tuition reimbursement program, got an undergraduate degree, an MBA, worked his way up through the ranks to become the program manager for the largest aerospace contract that GE ever had at that time. It was a half a billion dollars in 1984 dollars. It was a big deal. I learned a lot from Mr. Kozak. Um, because all I knew about big corporate America up to that point was what I saw in movies. And what I thought I saw in movies was very serious people, all business all the time, you know, running to and from meetings. And Mr. Kozak observed this in me and sat me down for the first of what became many one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations that we had. And what he said to me that day is up on the screen. It's about developing relationships. You need to make personal connections with people on a regular basis. It's not all about business. It's about building relationships. Uh, so I took this to heart, and Mr. Kozak would do this for various ways, like one simple example was at the weekly staff meeting, he'd have everyone go around and, and uh, share something personal with, the, with each other. And I learned the importance of this when, you know, pressure-filled, stressful situations arose, right? It was the foundation of good relations that we formed in between those stressful periods uh, that served us well, you know, allowed us to kind of work together to overcome whatever challenges that, that arose. All right, so making connections with people. I mean, that's really what it's all about. I know in my work, I always try to remind myself, you know, okay, we're getting some things done, great, we're teaching, great, but am I making personal connections with people? Uh, you know, this is all about people, isn't it? Uh, it wasn't too long after that that I found myself in uh, Mr. Kozak's office once again for a one-on-one -on, -one on a different topic. 
Uh, see, at that time, I kind of had an answer for everything. Now, some of you that know me probably think, Drew, you still have an answer for everything. I don't know, Jeff, do I? <laughs> I assure you I do not, but it may come across that way at times. Uh, and Mr. Kozak observed that in me. And again, it was those damn movies. You know, leaders, managers always had an answer for everything, real snap responses and things. I thought that's the way you're supposed to act. You know, what do I know? I, I did learn that movies can be very misleading. Um, so, you know, he sat me down, and this is what he said. You know, Drew, you don't have to have all the answers. You just need to know the questions. And this is when I learned for the first time, and Mr. Kozak really in, uh, encouraged us, it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know. And I find this often in my work, you know, dealing with managers, continuous improvement professionals, they, that they don't understand that. They feel they have to have an answer for everything. They're supposed to be the experts. But no one is, knows everything, right? Their head would explode if that's the case. And think about people you've met that, you know, come across as knowing everything. How do you feel about them? You know, in the beginning they might be okay, but after a while you're gonna get a little skeptical, kind of like Jamie's looking at me right now. Uh, you know, you're going to get a little skeptical, and over time, you probably would grow to distrust those, that person or persons. So I always like to remind myself, and I encourage others that I work with to say, it's okay to say, I don't know. All right? So as a matter of fact, a colleague I've been working with at a company for the last four years at his place, um, actually in Houston, he, he said to me um, last fall, he goes, do you realize how often you say, I don't know, when people ask you questions? I said, I never really gave it much thought. Uh, but, you know, if I don't have an answer for a person, what am I going to do, make things up? You know, humans are pretty smart, and they'll see through deception over time. And then, and then where would I be, right? So it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, next person I want to introduce you to is John Culp. Uh, Mr. Culp was not my manager, but uh, he was a person I worked with, and he observed some other concerning behaviors that I had. And he sat me down one day and he said this, if you lose credibility, pack up your bags and move on. We don't have any need for you. And this struck me in a very profound way. See, I had these expressions in my language that were very troublesome to Mr. Colt. Expressions that after this conversation, I expunged from my memory. I could not recall them for decades. In fact, I couldn't recall them until I was putting this presentation together for another conference a few years ago. See, what I had in my language was I would kind of preface something I was about to say with, believe me, trust me. I don't know if you know people like that. Well, Mr. Culp said, you know, only people that can't be believed and can't be trusted feel the need to say, believe me and trust me. So our conversation that day got deeper into credibility and, you know, how difficult it is to attain and how easy it is to lose. And, um, you know, I took this in a very profound way, so I always, you know, try to be very careful with the words that, that I choose. Uh, so I'll leave that one for, for you to uh, consider. Uh, the next person, well, what ended up happening, after I graduated from the corporate management program, I went to work with uh, our corporate engineering and manufacturing group. That was like our internal um, consulting group um, that we had. And I was involved in two major efforts. One was putting together our continuous process improvement methodology. It was a takeoff of Deming's PDCA. Uh, what we learned quite early was that people needed a little help with plan. There's a lot going on in plan, so we broke that down into four steps. You know, step one, understand your process. Step two, define the opportunity. Step three was like identify potential barriers. And step four was identify solutions, or what today we might call uh, countermeasures. All leading up to, to, to do, check, and act, okay? We also worked on what we called an integrated product and process development system. You, we, we would call that today lean product development. And uh, we applied for the first time that methodology to, in our major appliance business. And it failed miserably. So this is no exaggeration. The financial impact of that failure probably would have put Whirlpool out of business in 1986, I believe this was. So we met with our CEO, who in instructed us to do a lessons learned and come back with our next target for application. Now, being a graduate of the management development program, I had access to our CEO, and I asked him a question. I said, why is it no one, no GE employees, lost their job in the face of this horrible, horrible failure? All of the external consultants we were working with, they lost their jobs. But who cares about them, right? Hold on, wait a minute. You know. <laughs> but who cares about them? So, you know, he went on to make this statement. It's okay to fail as long as we learn from the experience we're trying to create a culture. 
Now, this surprised me, this kind of response, and probably surprises you if you know anything about our CEO. He had quite a reputation and not all of it very positive. All right? So he went on to describe, he goes, if he didn't respond properly, he could forget creating a culture willing to take some risk and, and being able to accomplish great things. So we went back, our group, and we, we did our lessons learned, and we identified um, aircraft engines as our next application. Now, as a frequent flyer, I don't know, what, you know in hindsight, I'm like, what were we thinking? Uh, but that, there we were very successful. We were very successful. We reduced time to market by 50%. And fortunately, we were doing this because Pratt Whitney was doing the exact same thing at the exact same time and getting similar results. Uh, so by the early 90s, there was only really two aircraft engine suppliers remaining in the United States. This is when I came to realize that PDCA was about learning. I didn't realize that up to the point. And I'm a Demonite from way back, and, and I just, just didn't quite grasp it until this moment, that PDCA is really about learning. Uh, off program, or after my stint really with the corporate engineering and manufacturing folks, I settled back down in the GE aerospace. People had said, if you can apply world-class concepts there, and that's what we called it at the time, uh, you can apply it anywhere, right? It's complicated, it's regulated, it's you know, low volume. So I kind of took that as a challenge. And I went and worked in one of our divisions in the GE Aerospace Division. And I ran into a lot, a lot of uh, resistance from the get-go. And a gentleman I worked with, a process engineer named Gil Zander, sat me down and said, Drew, you're not very good at what you do. It's like, OK, uh, do tell. And he went on to say, you know, you, you came in, you're very enthusiastic about these concepts, you know. How's it working for you? And I said, uh, not very well. And he goes, right, you're frustrated, we're frustrated. He says, it's the approach that you're taking. You know, at this point, my approach was quite directive. You know, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. And he said, you know, he made the suggestion to a different approach. He said, teach us your methods, teach us your tools, and, you know, let us figure out how to apply them. People will assign greater value to their own ideas. Do you agree with that? And they'll be more committed to making these, their ideas work. And he called this the value of self-discovery. So I went off, thought about this for a few days, came back, and I said, Mr. Zander, you are absolutely correct. And I changed my way ever since. Now, I find this very, very important in my work and the people I come across. You know, like at the University of Michigan's CADA program, we get a lot of continuous improvement uh, folks in that program. And they feel that's their job to tell people what and how to do all things of continuous improvement. And I'll ask them, you know, how's it working for you? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know, how's it working for you? And they'll usually, through the conversation, kind of describe some of the difficulties that I encountered years ago. Uh, you know, people were being resistant, they're not following through and su uh, sustaining changes that were made, you know, and the like. And I offer this suggestion to them, uh, the value of self-discovery that I had, was taught to be by Mr. Zander years before. Sometimes it helps some of them, sometimes people you know, don't choose, choose to go a different path, but a week or weeks don't go by that I don't think of what Mr. Zander taught me many years ago. It was also around this time that I was growing frustrated with senior management, because I came in just as a middle manager. And you know, I kind of understood why they weren't getting it, you know, senior managers. They, they didn't have access to the information that I did while on program, so I understood that. But I still was getting frustrated with them. So I reached out to my corporate mentor, a gentleman named Larry Bossidy. He was the number two guy at G at the time. He went on the run, Allied Signal. I learned a lot from Mr. Bossidy. Much different style than, than Mr. Welsh, a much preferred style. And I shared with him my frustration. And he said, Drew, don't let this deter you. He goes, just you know, worry about your sphere of influence. And you'll find out that your sphere of influence is a lot larger than you realize. So I went back with a little you know, renewed enthusiasm. And boy, was he right. Boy, was he right. You know, not only did other, you know, managers start seeing what we were trying to do, but senior management at that site did as well. And in two years, it started getting the attention of other divisions within the business group. And then I found myself being asked to lend assistance to the other divisions. And it was a large business group. We had 11 divisions. So I found out pretty early, I had a very large sphere of influence. Uh, and I offer the same bit of advice to others, you know, in the CI community. We can get frustrated, right, why people, others don't get it. You know, sometimes people will tell me, I'm not even going to try because my boss isn't, isn't into it. And I always give them the same bit of advice. You know, don't, don't let that deter you. Do what you know is right. 
in your area of, of uh, responsibility, your area of influence, and you're going to find out, like I did, that your sphere of influence is a lot larger than you realize. Mr. Bossidy also used to give this bit of advice. A leader needs to be looking ahead. A leader needs to always be looking ahead. And he would kind of joke about looking around the corner as well. Uh, if there's going to be improvement. Now, I would imagine uh, you probably run into what I run into. You know, a lot of folks, here we are coming in saying, okay, let's do deliberate process improvement. And they're looking at you like you're nuts. They're looking at you like you're nuts. You know, they don't have the time. Very importantly, you know, they don't have the emotional capacity because they're just trying to get through the day. Do you run into folks like that? I would think often. You know, so to try to add to their burden, they, they're looking at you like you're crazy. So, so very often, we have to kind of step back, I, at least I find this, that'll be helpful, and help them help themselves address whatever the sources of the chaos or, or instability is in their areas so we, they can free up the, the time and, very importantly, the emotional capacity uh, to be able to do deliberate process improvement. Now, how far out ahead should people look, uh, Mr. Bossi used to explain? Depends on your role, right? A supervisor should be looking at about three months. You know, where do I want my group and my process to be in about three months? Uh, a manager, you know, a middle manager probably looking at a year. Uh, senior leaders should be looking at years, all right? But I find this, again, very, very important, as I'm sure you do as well, because we've got to help people get through that day-to-day -day firefighting kind of... Um, approach that they're, that they're uh, kind of st stuck in, you know. And, and this can be difficult for them. This can be very, very difficult for them. You know, think about it. Maybe they were a good firefighter, and they were recognized as such as a good firefighter. Maybe they were promoted even to a position, of, a leadership position. Well, that's a deep, you know, why would they want to change their ways? Why would they want to change their ways? But we have to help them break those habits, even if as deep-rooted as they might be. Because if they can't kind of get out of the day-to-day -day and look ahead, there can be no improvement. By 1990, I came to the realization that 80% of all of this was behavioral. Right? The underlying principles of world class, as we called it at that time, were not difficult to understand. The difficulty was getting people willing to even try to practice these concepts. So as I often do, I go back to school to learn. And this time, I went back to... Uh, study organizational and behavioral science at Cornell University. And what's an engineer going back for organizational behavioral science doing? Well, you know, I, it's what I learned. Um, and when, this is when I came uh, to be introduced to Edward Thorndike. Now, I never met Edward Thorndike. In fact, he had passed away probably about 40 years prior to this point in time. But Edward Thorndike has been called the father of, of uh, educational psychology. And he published something called The Psychology of Learning in 1913. The educational psychology is how people attain knowledge, how they, how they uh, develop skill and create habits. And when you're, you know, kind of coming up with a new science, you have a tendency to call everything you come up with a law. And he had three laws. The law of readiness, the law of exercise, and the law of effect. The law of readiness is how prepared are people for learning and change in general? whether it be a large-scale change or a small-scale change, I don't think we have enough conversations with people to really ascertain their, their uh, state of readiness. I don't know if you agree with that, but you know, we need to have personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with them to really see, are they ready to learn? Are they ready to change? You know, for example, have they, have they bought into the reason for change? You know, do they believe that it's important? Uh, perhaps they have. Perhaps their difficulty at that moment is that they're preoccupied with things that are going on at home. And to be involved in, even in a small-scale change effort in work is just going to add to their, the anxiety level that they're already feeling. So I don't know about you, but I think we, you know, I find we just don't seem to have those personal conversations before we embark on any sort of major or minor change effort. The law of exercise is what it sounds like. It's practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect. Now, I don't know about perfection, but you, know, you certainly need practice in order to attain knowledge and, and uh, develop skill and create habits. The law of effect. What the law of effect is, humans will want to repeat positive experiences, and they'll want to avoid negative ones. You, know, you go burn yourself on an iron, you don't say, ooh, let's do that again. Yeah, geez, that'd be a little sick. <laughs> um, so what does this mean? We need to make sure that folks are having a positive experience as they're practicing continuous improvement. Now, just so I'm clear, I'm not saying 
that they always have to have a positive outcome, right? We know, we, everyone here, I'm preaching to the choir, everyone knows that you know, every PDCA cycle we do, every experiment we perform is not going to you know, result in a positive outcome. But nonetheless, we have to make sure that the experience is positive for people in the absence of a positive outcome. So how do we do that? Well, things like really focusing on the learning. Learning is a very positive thing for most people. Celebrating the, the trying, the experimenting, you know, and other ways. So again, we've got to help people make sure they have a positive outcome that they want to repeat over and over again, sometimes in the absence of a positive, um, a positive outcome. Now, what, what Thorndike said is if you practice these first three laws, what, what then will follow is the law of habit. And isn't that what we're really after? You know, getting people to make continuous improvement a habit, you know, in scientific thinking, a habit um, every day, thinking that way. So, you know, if we can get enough of those folks thinking and, and making that a habit, we can create a culture of continuous improvement. Isn't that the ultimate goal, to have a culture of continuous improvement? And I find this extremely important in my work because I, I see that most leaders do not get these principles. Most leaders do not get these principles. I mean, all of you do because you're here. Now, how do I know this? And I'm not talking like, you know, they have to know Edward Thorndike or anything like that and the psychology of learning. I'm just talking about the underlying principles. How do I know this is in my conversations, it usually starts with, I don't know why my people aren't getting it. I just don't understand. I said, well, explain to me what, what opportunities people have had to practice. And it's usually thing, responses like this. Well, everyone went to a class. I had made sure everyone got a class and whatever, lean or, or some specific concept. Or they'll tell me, well, everyone's been through a Kaizen event. Some people have been through two or three. Or they might say, uh, oh, you know, everyone had to do A3 storyboards. Some have even done two or three. And I'll ask a question. I say, from a personal standpoint, how many opportunities, real opportunities, have had, people had to, to really practice? And the response I usually get is about one to four in the course of a year. One to four in the course of a year. That's it. So then I usually follow up with another question, and I ask, does that sound like sufficient opportunity to practice? And they usually say, well, judging from the tone of your voice, I'm going to guess no. <laughs> so then I go on, and I explain to them what we've known for 100 years or longer, what it really takes. And it's a heck of a lot more than one to four opportunities in a, in a year. So I think this is extremely important uh, for, for leaders to understand so they can have more reasonable expectations and they can be more supportive, you know, if they really understand what it, what it takes. It was at the same time when I learned about the psychology of learning and what it really takes for people to attain knowledge and create uh, skills and, and develop um, habits, was scale does not matter. This was a, a, a reflection, a revelation for me that was quite disturbing. See, I was told this little bit of advice four years prior by a gentleman named Steve Heggie, who I worked with at Corporate Engineering and Manufacturing. He was like my mentor for all things continuous improvement at that time. And Steve used to tell me, Drew, it's not about the scale of change, it's about change itself. And it just didn't sink in. It didn't sink in for four years until I learned about the psychology of learning. And he used to ask this question of me, and I'll pose to you. What's the likelihood of someone changing after one, albeit large change, versus a person that has been through maybe four, or five, six small changes. I would get his point, right? The person that's been through more change cycles is probably more willing and capable of changing again. But, 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 I would say, you know, we can, we can accomplish big changes. And I continued, continued to pursue large-scale changes. When I learned about the psychology of learning and what you know, makes people tick, basically, I realized all the missed opportunities that I had for small-scale change, for myself, for the people I was working with, and this struck me very hard. All the missed opportunities for people to help, and, and myself included, to help you know, uh, improve our change skills, our, our process improvement skills. And this comes up a lot in the University of Michigan Kata program. We get a lot of CI professionals that, that participate, and they will get to the same realization as I did, and they will react very strongly sometimes even yelling at us. I'm not kidding. They start yelling at us. And they'll come up like during a break a little later and say, you know, Drew, I wasn't really yelling at you. I was yelling at myself. I said, I get it. 
You know, I yelled at myself when I came to this realization of all the missed opportunities. So I usually try to encourage them, you know, don't beat yourself up. Learn from the past, change your way going forward. Uh, and that helps some of them. I don't know if it helps all of them. But scale really does not matter for everything what we're trying to do. Small incremental improvement all counts uh, in the ultimate goal. By the mid-1990s, I came across another person that I never met. Uh, Walt Kelly he was actually a cartoonist. He wrote a comic strip called um, Pogo. I don't know if anyone remembers Pogo. It's probably been out of print for a long time. Some of us older folks remember that, right? Al's shaking his head over there knowingly. And uh, what I read uh, was is up on the screen. A certainty of misery is better than the misery of uncertainty. Think about what that means. The, the, the uncertainty of misery. I'm sorry. The certainty of misery is better than the misery of uncertainty. Think about what that means. You know, I like to listen to people, and they like to complain to me. They complain about their process, maybe their boss, their coworkers. And then when that conversation kind of circles around to, okay, what can we do about it? Oh, no, no, you can't do that, you can't do this. So as displeased as they are with the current situation, to go to an unknown type of situation is a, is a worse proposition. The certainty of misery is better than the misery of uncertainty. Okay? And, you know, this is important to, to understand. You know, I learned from behavioral science that this is human nature. You know, the human brain seeks certainty, wants to conserve energy, so it wants to stay with the known and familiar. I understand that. This is human nature. There's a great sense of safety of staying with the known and familiar. So how do we help people? How do we help people? If this is human nature, how do we help them? So what I've learned is we have to help people kind of replace their need for certainty in the outcome or the result with confidence in the process of achieving the outcome or result, the process of continuous improvement. And if they get enough opportunity to practice, 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 they can really develop their confidence. So again, replacing their need for certainty in the outcome or result with the process of achieving the outcome or result. So a week or weeks don't go by, and I don't think of this one uh, in my work. Um, the last person I want to introduce you to is Bo Keat. Some of you uh, may know Bo. Um, I've known him since uh, 1993. We, we worked through the rest of that decade working, uh, applying lean in healthcare and, and manufacturing and non-manufacturing organizations alike. By the mid-2000s, we were at the University of Michigan. We, we set up a few of their um, lean programs at that time. And at this point in time in my life, I had heard it all. Heard it all. All the negativity. You know, lean won't work, you know, why we're different. I'm sure you hear, you know, these kind of things or whatever term they're using. Um, my doctor always says, Drew, you got to stay away from negative people. I said, do you know what I do for a living? <laughs> you know? So what had happened was people would, you know, our students would kind of be starting to post a, a, pose a question or, or maybe make a point. And I, I wasn't listening. I already had a response, you know, because I heard it all. You know, I heard it all. And very often my response had nothing to do with the point they were trying to make, nor the question they were posing, because I just stopped listening. And Bo sat me down and said, Drew, you've you got to start listening. Students were complaining, and as he said, it was warranted. So this struck me very strongly, because, I mean, how can I be a good instructor? How can I be a good coach if I don't have good listening skills? So I, you know, I sat back, I reflected, I thought of some things my mother taught me many years ago about listening being a gift. I thought she was kidding. You know, she was right. Uh, and I put some techniques in place to help me be a better listener. Now, frankly, I forget those techniques sometimes. I'm human like everyone else. And this is just something we all got to work on, myself included, to be a better listener. Well, where I find this important in my work is, as you probably do, you probably find yourself often in that second coaching role, right? Where you're observing a manager, leader, or a CI professional coaching others in the, in the uh, ways of continuous improvement. And often what I'm watching and observing is that they're not very good listeners. And I provide that feedback to them. And then this is what I get. Oh, no, I, I, I got to stick to uh, stick to the five questions, if it's the coaching product questions that they're using. I, gotta st I can't break the pattern. You know, I got to stick to the script. And I'm like, but if you're not really listening to your learner and adjusting accordingly, then how effective is your coaching? So this is important. We, we all need to be good listeners and work hard at this. So my time is almost up, I believe. I'm looking at going for the high sign. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So as I said at the outset of this, you know, I, probably none of this is new for you. But hopefully you agree that it's always good to get a good reminder of these things. 
Uh, and you probably could tell similar stories, right, of, of kind people that offered you advice or even more deliberate coaching and mentoring, right? Or maybe you read something profound in a comic strip like I did uh, with Pogo. So what I would like to suggest to you, and you're probably doing this already, many of you, uh, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but to look around you and see who could you lend a helping hand to, maybe as a, a formal mentor or coach, or just offer some bits of advice as so many kind people offered me in, in my career. Uh, or maybe it's you who wants some help. Look around once again and say, who could help me? And reach out to them. You know, it, not, wouldn't, it wouldn't just help you, but it would also be richly rewarding for them. And you'll probably find, as I have over the years, that your sphere of influence is much larger than you realized. So I thank you very much again for your time. I hope this contributed in some small positive way to your summit experience. I really, really encourage you to continue the noble work you're doing because it is important work. So I encourage you to continue on, even in the face of adversity, which we all run into. And finally, have a great day, too, of the Kata Summit. Kata Kata. Oh, I hear